Welcome back to our fifth lesson on the original sin. We're looking at Adam and Jesus compared. Romans 5. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. Therefore, just as through one man sin, <clears throat> one man sin into the world, death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. So then, through one man's transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted the opportunity of justification of life to all men. For as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so, the obedience of the one, the many were made righteous. Before and after, in Adam, sin entered, death by sin, condemnation, judgment, all must die, Moses, law enters, sin abounds, sin reigned unto death. Much more in Christ, atonement is finished, grace by Christ, justification, gift of grace for all, Christ's obedience, grace abounds, grace reigns through righteousness unto life. Physical and spiritual death came from Adam's sin. In 5.12-21, Paul shows that Jesus will undo the consequences that Adam brought upon mankind when he sinned. The first Adam turned from the Father in the Garden of Eden. The last Adam turned to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. The first Adam was naked and ashamed in the Garden. The last Adam was naked and bore our shame on the cross. The first Adam's sin brought us thorns. The last Adam wore a crown of thorns. The first Adam substituted himself for God. The last Adam was God, substituting himself for us. The first Adam sinned at a tree. The last Adam bore our sins on a tree. The first Adam died as a sinner. The last Adam died for sinners. The first Adam lost the tree of life. The last Adam is the tree of life. The first Adam was the head of the old creation. The last Adam was the head of a new creation. The first Adam was created in God's image. The last Adam is God's image. The first Adam was to reign over all the earth. The last Adam will reign over all forever and ever. The second Adam, Jesus in the garden. But the free gift is not like a transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if by because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So death reigned through Adam, the gift of grace reigns through Jesus. Death exerted a sinister control over man between the time of Adam and Moses because of sin. This is true both of those who sinned as unlike as well as those in like ways sinned. To, uh, did Adam sin. Sin and death are aspects of the kingdom of Satan, which will be overcome by the work of Christ and his kingdom. Paul will again use the metaphor of reigning in Romans 5.17 and Romans 5.21. Adam lived by grace in favour with God. Adam lost favour, grace, with God, through his trespasses a falling aside from right duty. Adam fell from grace by disobeying God. Through Jesus, grace restores us to favour. The principle is that man's standing in grace is a relationship to be maintained. Christ restored grace to man. Grace, a free gift, free gift abounded for many. The grace was seen in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the blood shed that we might have the opportunity of salvation. It should also be noted that even though there are several parallels between Adam and Christ, there are also some distinct contrasts between the two. Paul first contrasts the sin of Adam with the gift of God. Adam's sin brought certain consequences into the world for mankind, principally death, both spiritual and physical, but God's gift brought life. 
However, as been shown, each man is responsible for himself spiritually. That is, each one is guilty only of his own sin rather than that of Adam or any other. Many, or the many, includes all mankind who have physically died. In scripture, many sometimes means all. Jesus shed his blood, per pollen, for many. That is, he died for all. To give all the opportunity. We will see Jesus, who had been a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Much more the grace of God. Is Christ's work broader in scope than Adam's? Does it embrace more people? Is it more powerful? It is more certain and dependable. It does much more indicate the greater inclination of God to save and to punish. Like a sin that separated Adam from divine fellowship in Eden, each man's personal sin separates between him and God. The work of Christ forgives man and brings him back into fellowship with God. It also provides a future reward in heaven. The gain through Christ is much more than the loss through Adam. In this way, the work of Christ is much more than Adam's. Adam's one sin brought physical death and condemnation on all men because he lost access to the tree of life. Christ's one gift can declare us righteous after many trespasses, adultery, hate, murder, disobedience to parents, etc. Paul speaks of the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ. The gift of God is eternal life, the wonderful gift of God that comes by grace through the sacrificial blood of Christ. When we acknowledge that grace comes from both God and Christ, have we not accepted the deity of Christ? Abounding to many, the abundant riches of salvation are available to everyone in Christ Jesus through the gospel. For as in Adam all die, and even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Comparing Adam and Christ, we have the introduction or introduced spiritual death, brought condemnation, an act of transgression, disobedience made many sinners a possibility, introduced spiritual life, brought justification, an act of righteousness, obedience made many righteous a possibility. Thus far in Romans, Paul has contrasted the result of Adam's sin and Christ's gift of grace. The gift of Christ brings the remedy to many more than one man, Adam alone. So take the gift to be the boldly, bodily resurrection that all will receive unconditionally. It is better understood it to be whatever grace provides, mainly eternal salvation. We may be sure that the gift brings eternal happiness to all who respond to the gospel in obedient faith. One sin is all it took for Adam to be punished. That sin resulted in untold loss. Christ's righteous act results in uncountable blessing. Adam's sin and Christ's disobedience differ in results. Adam was expelled from the garden for one offence, one transgression that resulted in condemnation. Judgment because of Adam's sin came upon the whole human race in the form of the loss of access to the tree of life, bringing condemnation of physical death. In which you once lived, Ephesians 2, 2, 3, he says, by nature, in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit is now at work among those who are disobedient. We too were all among them once, living only by our natural inclinations, obeying the demands of human self-indulgence and our own whim. Our nature made us no less liable to God's retribution than the rest of the world. Nature a mode of feeling and acting which by long habit has become natural. Practice sin, child of wrath. Practice righteousness, child of God. And your little ones too, Deuteronomy 1, 39 says, who you said would be seized as booty, these children of yours who do not get no good from evil, they will go in, I shall give it to them, and they will own it. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, the father shall not be put to death for the children, Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sins. Second Samuel twelve sixteen to 23 While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Second Kings fourteen six. 
But the children of murderers he slew not according to, unto that which is written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein the law is commanded, saying, The father shall not be put to death for the children, nor the children be put to death for the father, but every man shall be put to death for his own sin. In Ezekiel 18.20, The soul that sins, it shall die. The soul shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Ezekiel 33.20 Yet you say, The way of the Lord is not equal. O ye house of Israel, I will judge you every one after his ways. Isaiah 7.15-16 by the time his child is old enough to eat cards and honey, he will know enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong. But before he knows right from wrong, the two kings you fear so much, the king of Israel and Aram, will both be dead. Jeremiah 31, 29-30 In those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set in edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eats the sour grape, his teeth shall be sat on edge. Some people claim there be no escape the taint of Adam other than by Jesus. Romans 3.10 it is written as none righteous, no, not one. Genesis 7.1 says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come you and all your house unto the ark, for you have seen righteous, been, I, I have seen righteous before me in this generation. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and his evil. Luke 1, 5-6. In the days of Herod, the head of the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abai, and he had a wife, the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. Paul says it was through the sin, the trespass of Adam, that death was able to reign. But now, through the gift of righteousness, the death of Christ, God accepts us and gives us the gift of life. The offence, the trespass, the authorised version says, refers to Adam's transgression in the garden, while the phrase, the righteousness of one, one act of righteousness, refers to the righteous act of God in freely giving his only begotten Son. Christ justifies one man's act of righteousness, resulting in acquittal and life. Adam disobeyed God. Then the law came, and because men were disobedient, they demonstrated their feelings all the more. As us, with policemen, deliberately flagged the law. The law served to provoke the attitude that is opposite, opposed to God. Mark 10, 14 says, And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to him, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them. But it's as such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. And he said, I assure you, unless you turn from your sins and become as little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. A child must grow to know how to refuse evil and choose good. Free gift of righteousness, forgiveness of sin, salvation, the gift of the indwelling spirit, are all a gift of grace. It is, a free, it is free in as much as it has been totally paid for by Christ. God's grace is far more comprehensive than merely atoning for Adam's one sin. By faith it covers everyone and everything in Christ. The many comprise all mankind. See verse 15. In the present context, many offences or many trespasses means all trespasses. Christ's obedience results in righteousness. It's called the gift of righteousness. In verse 17, righteousness in this context is the same as having faith counted as righteousness. When God counts men righteous, he saves them by his grace. Sinners are counted righteous when they are forgiven, acquitted and judged, free from sin so they may be saved eternally. How awful are the results of one sin of Adam? In God's sight, any and all sin is dreadful, disastrous and deadly. An individual dies spiritually when he chooses to reject Christ and go into sin. Until Christ came, nothing stopped the relentless, just and cruel victory march of death through the world. Death reigned. All their lives people lived in fear of death. It was one of the, Satan's greatest weapons. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and set free all those who had been held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. When now through Christ, they say, O death, 
where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Christ brings more than bodily resurrection. He provides the gift of righteousness or spiritual life, a relationship with God. Spiritual death reigned through Adam, that is, it began its reign through the myriads of people, because all sinned, all committed, all were disobedient. The bodily resurrection is a major part of what awaits us saved. The abundance, the fullness of God's grace. Justified freely by his grace. To demonstrate his righteousness. The abundance of grace. The gift of righteousness. The abundance of joy. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. God provides abundantly. The ploughman shall overtake the reaper. I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think, shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded to many. Look again at verse 16. The gift of righteousness is salvation. A gift is something one is free to accept or reject. Salvation may be accepted or rejected because we have free will. Thus it may rightly be called a gift. If something is earned, it's not a gift. No one earns salvation. Those who receive the abundance of grace, those who receive the gift of righteousness, they will reign, implying dignity, liberty and blessedness, Thea says. In afterlife, even without Christ, there are meaningful events and joyful times. Even though death reigned, life before Christ was not totally wretched and miserable. But for the Christian, life is a joy, and in a sense, eternal. The future of Christians is much, much more than just the ending of death's reign. Through forgiveness in heaven, every tear will vanish, and fullness of joy will overwhelm every soul. Therefore, as one man, one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification or the opportunity of justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many were made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Adam, disobedience, death to all. Jesus, obedience, life to all. The opportunity. At this juncture, Paul, in his discussion, has reached a point where he's able to draw thoughts from what has been written so far. For one man, Adam, who sinned, who committed one man's offence, transgression or trespass, is the condemnation. In a totally different sense, condemnation of sin is said to be of God. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Paul says it was through the sin of Adam that death was able to reign. But now through the gift of righteousness, the death of Christ, God accepts us and gives us the gift of life. Offence, trespass, the A.S. American Standard Version says, refers to Adam's transgression in the garden, while the phrase righteousness of one, one act of righteousness, refers to righteous act of God in freely giving his only begotten Son. Christ justifies one man's act of righteousness resulted in acquittal and life. Adam disobeyed God, then the law came, and because men were disobedient, they demonstrated their feelings all the more. As with the policeman deliberately flight the law, the law serves to provoke the attitude that is opposed to God. Where sin increased, grace increased much more. In what sense could all men be condemned and justified? If one were unconditional, original sin, then the other one would have to be unconditional. We know universal salvation is not true, and yet we also know that God is no respecter of persons. Both sins and righteousness are based on free will choice of man. The law was given to provide knowledge of sin to man. As knowledge of sin grew, so did man's understanding that he had broken a direct command of God, similar to what Adam had done. As knowledge of sin grew, so did man's awareness of his need for forgiveness. 
In verse 19, Paul further explains the thought he expressed in verse 18, when he spoke of the act of Adam's sin and the act of Christ's righteousness. The word disobedience implies a refusal to hear, or at least a careless attitude, towards God's will. They have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, who refused to hear my words. They have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel, the house of Judah, have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers, Jeremiah says in 11 verse 10. Therefore thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring on Judah and on all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the doom that I pronounced against them. Because I have spoken to them and they have not heard, I have called to them, but they have not answered. In our day there are many who neglect to hear and obey the gospel. Others carelessly live an unfaithful life. By one act of disobedience, Adam made many sinners. By one act of obedience, many were made righteous. Christ's act of obedience was his death and resurrection on the cross, or death on the cross. In Romans 5, 6 to 10, Paul teaches it was through the death and the blood of Christ that sinners are reconciled to God. Paul presents the same truth here in verse 19, but from a different perspective. The emphasis here is on the disobedience of Adam as opposed to the obedience of Christ. Through his act, Christ through his act of obedience stepped in for humanity to offer to God what humanity could not offer, a pure and perfect sacrifice for sin. Just like one man's disobedience, so many choose to be lost. So it is by one man's, i.e. the Christ's righteous obedience, that as many as choose to be are brought into a right standing with God. I know that Calvinist and his followers don't, don't believe that. Many become sinners because Adam, by choosing to disobey, introduced sin into the world. And then all who reach an accountable age who also choose to sin, spiritually die. Spiritual death is a consequence for all who sin, separation from God. So because we choose to disobey in a similar act of, of disobedience like Adam, many will become sinners. Jesus' one act of obedience makes a sinner righteous after he has committed many sins. But a sinner must also choose to obey, to perform the act of obedience by faith, to be justified, forgiven and saved through the blood of Jesus. Choosing to disobey like Adam, many became sinners. Paul contrasts one act with the other. Adam's one transgression or, trans or trespass is placed in view alongside Christ's one act of righteousness, his atoning death. Christ's act of righteousness is one act of obedience. Paul calls it one man's obedience. Having been found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 says. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, the Hebrew writer says. Romans 1 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, what to do? To bring about the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for his name's sake. Romans 16, 26, this secret has now been made clear through the prophetic writings. The eternal God ordered this. So when it becomes known, all nations will believe it and obey. How can faith be obeyed? What happens when a sinner obeys the faith? Just as condemnation is conditional, so is righteousness. Men and women are made righteous by Christ through the gospel. Romans 6, 17, 18 says, But thanks be to God, that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you are committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. <clears throat> Acts 22, 15, 16, For you will be a witness for him, to all men, for what you have seen and heard. Now don't wait any longer. Rise up and get yourself immersed, and get your sins washed away, trusting in his name, Paul's own account of how he became a Christian. He continues in Romans 6, verse 3 to 5, Do you not know that all of us who have been immersed into Christ Jesus were immersed into his death? So that by your baptism into his death we were buried with him? So as Christ was raised from the dead by the Father's glorious power, we too should begin living a new life. If we have been joined to him by dying a death like his, so we shall be, be saved by a resurrection like his.
thinking you can put something else in there. So we shall be by a resurrection like this. Okay, so immersed into his death, we should begin to live a new life, joined to him by dying a death like his, so we shall be in a resurrection like his. By doing God's, uh, by God's doing grace, you are in Christ. For we're all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we're all given the one spirit to drink. This passage is talking about the idea that the Holy Spirit has told us what we need to do in order to be saved, and when we've done that, we will be saved because we're in tune with the Spirit. It's a mystical union. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, immersing them into the into, into a relationship with, into the name of, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we're immersed in Jesus, we become the righteousness of God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 29 says, We are immersed into Christ, into a relationship with Christ. So there's a contrast between Adam and Jesus. The old man Adam, sin, trespass, and disobedience involves all humanity by default and sinfulness, judgment, condemnation, and ultimately death. If we disobey like Adam disobeys, we will suffer the same consequence. Whereas the new man in Christ, there is acts of righteousness. We have become obedient we have obedient faith. It involves all humanity who are willing to put our trust in Jesus and as a result is righteousness. We are made right with God. It comes through the free gift of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus by the grace of God. We are justified just as if we never sinned and the end result is we have a new life in Christ. Your eternal life is in the balance. Paul now ends his discussion about Adam and Christ. He resumes his consideration of the law that left him off in verse 13. There is a logical transition from information about Adam and Christ, for example, in the discussion about Adam and Christ, as well as that of the law. He mentions the reign of death by sin. So next we'll look at law, the sin, grace, and salvation, if you're willing to come back and spend a little bit more time. Every blessing.